Hello and welcome to episode 3 of the Tom Finn podcast. Today's guest is Dan Starkey. Dan is a British actor who is probably best known for his role as the Sontaran Strax in Doctor Who. He also appears on Class Dismissed and Wizard vs. Aliens for CBBC, as well as various other shows. You might have recently seen him appearing on Good Omens and Years and Years. We discuss all of that, as well as acting under heavy prosthetics, comedy improv, and the benefits of restricted height. I'll talk more at the end of the podcast, but for now, Dan Starkey. So we're in your London flat. <laughs> yes, my, my <laughs> spacious London flat. Yes. yes. Um, so did you grow up in London? No, oh, no, 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 no. I'm from, um, I lived in Cardiff when I was very small, um, um, but I grew up on the Welsh border. Okay. So in between uh, Monmouth and Ross and Wye. So yeah, nearest railway station is about 40 miles away. And so yeah. like, there's a bus about three times a day, sort of like yeah. uh, hills and sheep. But yeah, the very early part of my childhood was so like right in the centre of Cardiff. But then so it's, it's, it's a funny sort of like a, yeah, two, two halves. Two yeah. Halves. yeah. So you, did you experience the sort of busy city and the small town thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's uh, yes, it's, it's interesting. I remember, um, I remember, uh, yeah, when I was until I was about seven, I was able to like to, to walk to the walk to the shop and so like you know, I was able to go to the the shop at the end of the street and buy some sweeties or whatever. Yeah, and then uh, then moved to the countryside. It was much more so like oh okay, I need to walk two kilometres to school. Yeah, and it's all and it's all green and it's yeah. uh, very 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 different very very different sort of spatial life and stuff. And they also you have your pals in the street you just play with, and then sort of like all of a sudden, all oh, right, I've got to walk to my friend's house again for about uh, like half a kilometre. So it's a very yeah. different uh, different different flavour of. <laughs> Did you end up ever driving at all? No, I still can't. I still can't legally drive. Right. But, um, no, I, I, I did. I did an intensive course a couple of years ago. But I, uh, yeah, no, it's 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 one thing on my list of things which I, I can basically drive. Yes. But I don't have a driving license. So uh, yeah, yeah. I know people like that as well. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, because I come from yeah. a similar sort of uh, small town, so yeah. driving was the only way I could do anything. Yes. And yeah. still is. Yeah. Um, my pals learned to drive sooner than I did, so I just rather relied on them. So it's kind of a yeah, yeah. Free well, loaded. <laughs> there's, I, uh, I can't remember who said it, but someone said like, when you're sort of a teenager, you want friends who can drive, and then when you're sort of thirty to forty, you want friends who are mechanics, or you want friends who are doctors, <laughs> right? Oh <laughs> yeah, 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 and yes, things yes. like that. Yeah. Um, so I read that you studied Anglo-Saxon, Norse, and Celtic at Cambridge. Yes. So how did you, what led you to doing that? Um, I saw it in the prospectus. I was always going to do, um, I thought I'd do, we would do English. Yeah. That was the obvious choice. But also I did other things. I did languages as well. So like at, uh, at school, you know, I said, I did so like classical languages. So I did, I did ancient Greek for A-level. Right. And I just, basically I just thought that sounds exciting. Cause I did, I did, I did so like, uh, I did Russian at A-level as well. So I did so like A-level Russian in two years and and that, that, that sounded like an, like an exciting, shiny option. Yeah. And then, in, likewise, I was going to like do, uh, oh, I thought I'll do English at university. And then it's like, I saw that in the prospectus, in the Cambridge prospectus, and I thought, oh, why not Why not try to do that? So it was kind of a bit of a whim that I thought, actually, why, why the hell not? Right. And so then I did do it. And it was an interesting mixture of things. I think it was kind of, uh, it's an interesting subject. It's very, very forensic. It made me think in a way that I don't naturally think. So I've got a bit of a magpie brain that sort of like goes, goes around and stuff. But this is very, because it was a very, very academic op- option. Right. So that, you know, writing lots of essays, but you don't get sort of like any credit of necessary sort of like uh, your own thoughts unless you can show that you're part of a conversation that's been going on for a very long time. So knowing how to use footnotes, you don't make baseless assertions about a thing. You actually, so actually learning how to do that was quite a thing, as well as learning it's like about four different languages from scratch. You know? Yeah. Or learning, you know, getting a reading knowledge as well. Um, so, so were you were you good at school? Was school something you enjoyed? Yeah, no, I was, I was, I was quite academic. Yeah, I was right. very academic. So yeah, I, I, I enjoyed learning stuff. Yeah. And I was quite uh, quite quite bookish. Um, but also, I, I, I found out that I liked doing plays at school as well. And that sort of crept up on me. Yeah. It didn't occur to me. Because when, when I was little, I wanted to be a scientist. Because that was always, always the sort of thing that uh, I was interested by. And then when I went to secondary school, I started doing languages and stuff like that. That, that, that sort of interested me in English. That sort of interested me slightly more. So I could have gone both ways. But then with yeah. my A-levels, I went for more art subjects. Than sort of, uh, it's, it's interesting yeah. meeting someone, who, uh, meeting a creative who actually did well at school, mm-hmm. sort of enjoyed academic things. It's, mm. it's, I find it rare. Everyone yeah. I meet is like, yeah, I was crap. <laughs> <laughs> and then I just discovered this. Yeah. No, it's, 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 I, th- I think we're all... I think most creative people are a matter of contradictions anyway. Mm. And I think that's all, it's the weird kind of thing that I have one half in me, which is very sort of like, you know, 
So, I, you know, so being quite, you know, sitting in the university library, like, you know, I, 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 I did think about, I did a further qualification. I did uh, an MPhil after I did my BA. Right. And I did think about doing a PhD, but I think I would have gone mad. Yeah. But um, there is that part of me, which, you know, sort of sitting in the, in the library and hating library dust. Could have done that. Yeah. Then the other side of me, which is a show off. And it's just <coughs> reconciling those two two halves of things. And I think lots of actors have that as a kind of thing. Mm. You do have that, that, that sort of quiet sort of... Um, if you're just a complete extrovert, okay, there are some people like that who I who I know, but then kind of quite often what you see is what you get. Um, and you know, for the the, 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 the yeah, for those of who who those of us who have those two different sides, it's kind of uh, yeah, you have that sort of like outward side, and then there's the other side of it which makes you want to do the detective work behind the part. Yeah, when you're looking at all those sort of like depths underneath things, then it's kind of like it's a slightly different diff- different different kettle of fish. So it's yeah, kind of, uh, yeah, it seems to be. I think you, you get people from Cambridge like that, that have that. Um, I know famously uh, John Cleese studying to be yeah. a lawyer. Yes. And then becomes an actor and comedian. So yeah. I guess that's something you get a lot from sort of the Oxbridge yes. world. Yeah. Things. Yeah. And, you know, and I didn't quite... Yeah, it's funny. I'm, I'm very glad. When I went to drama school, when I, when I went to Bristol, um, one of my flatmates, she was going off to do uh, to, uh, to see... I think she had pals at the university. She was going off to see uh, a student production. Right. Bristol. She, oh, do you want to come? And I had this flashback and thought, oh, hang on, I never have to do student drama again. So like, no, that's very kind of you. Oh, 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 <laughs> yeah. No, 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 thanks. No, I think I've got past that. Yeah. So this whole thing of, yeah, I'm just glad. Yeah, I was fine at the time, but I'm just very glad I never had to do sort of like that, that kind of thing. Well. It wasn't quite, never felt I quite hit my stride with the whole student drama thing. And yeah. I didn't go straight to drama school after university as well. I had just like a normal job for a couple of years as well. So it's kind of, yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't a complete fit yeah. at the time, and I think it's yeah. So what led you to going? It was the old Vic, right? Yeah, the Bristol, Bristol Vic. Yeah, what led yes. you to going there? I, I I always wanted to to do acting, but the I wasn't entirely sure about it. And I after I graduated from university, um, I got a book which I found in Waterstones that um, that actually one of my friends, late dad, wrote um, a chap called Simon Dunmore, who's very involved with drama training, called An Actor's Guide to Getting Work. And it's a very useful how-to guide. I think there's new editions of since, several new editions, but so like it was lots of very basic commonsensical things about when you go to an audition and they ask you what you're doing. You don't sort of say, oh, well, I came on the 176. So no, that's about what you're doing acting-wise. Lots of things you wouldn't necessarily know about how the industry works or how it works then. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a decent introduction um, to things and you know, what drama training's like, what, what it's like, so like trying to, trying, to, try, trying to live as an actor. It's a basic thing, but one of the first things, you know, that's like, do you really want to do this? And so if you have any doubts about this, then wait. The industry will always be here, but you might necessarily not be. So I thought, okay, I do kind of want to do this, but having also, having been at university straight from secondary school as well, so like I've been in full-time education, you know, from however long, I, I don't think I want to go straight back into another institution, mm. you know, so like, like, as a drama drain. So I sort of like that, okay. I'll, uh, yeah, I had, so I, I went to London and I had a kind of like a, I always was doing little bits and stuff on the side, like sort of fringy things and people who I knew from university were doing like small scale things. Um, so I was still, still keeping it sort of ticking over, sort of slightly, um, but I had a normal job for a couple of years. Um, and then basically it was an itch that sort of like kept on insisting, if you don't try and do this at least once in your life, then you'll be very resentful. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So I, but it's good actually because in some ways, because like I went to drama school when I was, yeah. The start of the term was a day after my twenty seventh birthday, and I think I got probably I probably got more out of it then than I would have done if I'd just gone at eighteen. Mm. I think I yeah. can only speak for myself there, but yeah. like, and I always I don't know. That's all, all counterfactuals and stuff. But yeah. it was kind of, um, but yeah, I, th- I think by then. I was aware this is what I want to sort of properly commit to. And I've had all the stuff, you know, sort of like, yeah, when you move to London for the first time in your early 20s and it's all kind of like, it's like, oh God, there's a whole sort of like, you know, sort of like city there and it's all sort of, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's all quite, it can be quite overwhelming. And so, you know, some of the people who I sort of know from sort of like drama school, so like did it for a couple of years and went, okay, and actually, and went off because I was younger, went off and so like, yeah, had a normal job after that because, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy to work in an office having got that out of my system, but I think I had it the other way around. Okay. It's like, okay, no, if I don't try and pursue this, then I'm going to be very, very annoyed. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but, you know, however many years it is down the line after that, you know, sort of it's uh, 15, 16 or so years after I, uh, after I, uh, made that decision, mm. then I'm still just about making a living at it. Yeah. <laughs> I think oh, all of us think we're just about, yeah, you yeah. know, so we're just, 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 just about sort of uh, making a living at it. And uh, yeah. I think the, the, the waiting is, is quite um, an interesting thing to hear as well, because 
a lot of people think it's like, okay, um, you're doing it and you go to work, 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 and you've made it. But like mm. the idea yeah. of being like, uh, not yet, it's not my time yet, I think it's quite interesting. Yeah, and it's a long game and it's a whole thing of, it's, it's, it's the way in which you've got to keep yourself, you've got to keep yourself mentally healthy sort of during the job because it's all about sort of rejection and, you know, most of the times the reality is you're going to go up for things which you're not going to get. But it's a whole thing of all you can do is go there and like present what you have, you know, offer what you've got right. and then... Um, yeah, and then people can take it or leave it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it, it, it's a very long game, hmm. and you know it, it, it'll get to you know some of my friends, you know, sort of like for absolutely sort of valid like valid life reasons, the amount of stuff that you've got to displace in your life in order to pursue acting full time was not the amount of satisfaction they got out of acting wasn't commensurate with the amount of stuff that they had to so like put on the back burner. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, for for me, it's still it's still it's still working. It's still, yeah. still work life balance, but you know who knows who knows what will happen down the line. But uh... I, well, I was speaking to Graham Duff the other day, and he said something about um, something along the lines of you've got to enjoy the the process as much as the final result. Yes, yeah. Is that yeah. something that applies to you? I think I think it's it's good actually. One of my first jobs um, out of drama school, my first big money job, which was a big sort of Christmas show. Right. So, well, the first of many magical creatures I've played. So yeah. I'm five foot two, and I get a cars and all these things. I was I was playing an evil elf yeah. in a Christmas show, uh, and it was quite a big musical theatre type thing, which is it's just not really my world. But it was interesting, you know. So I, everyone, you know, terribly nice, and it was a fun production. But so sort of like, I remember one of the girls, and that's what I was saying because I was still having just come out of drama school and living out of a suitcase and sort of going right now I'm not going to spend any money that whole kind of thing of going look you've got to enjoy the ride because yeah. you know you're working you know, with, with, especially with something like that when you've got sort of a, it's a full on show and you know you're sort of like singing dancing there's a 2,200 seater audience you know yeah. sort of like a, you know, it, 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 it's a big thing to access you've got to you've got to enjoy this because if you only think about it until the next thing you're, you're not living in the moment for it as well so mm. Got to be sensible as well in terms of you know just don't don't splurge everything, but equally yeah. you sort of um, yeah you you you've got to enjoy the ride, otherwise what what, what are you doing it for? Yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. And I think that that was a good thing. I, actually, actually, well, actually, I can, I can enjoy this. Hmm. So I think that's that's a useful thing as well, and it's a whole thing of uh, oh god, there's so much guff at the moment about so like mindfulness and about practicing gratitude. It's a whole thing of being it's like well if if you're not sort of like haven't got your eyes open to sort of like you know. It's reminding yourself and tapping on the shoulder. I, I could still be working in an office and so like not not being entirely happy about that. So the fact that I'm actually getting a chance to sort of do the job that I wanted to do, that's 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 a constant source of like, yeah, this is this is really good. That's, yeah, yeah. Um, that's fine. So I'm I'm very pleased, you know. And so not not all, you know, all all the meetings, you know, some of the meetings that I go up for, not all of them go my way, but I'm still I'm still in the game. So that's kind of a, yeah. I hope yeah. it doesn't sound like I'm <laughs> convincing myself or something, but it's no, I genuinely, yeah, genuinely, yeah. it's, it's, you know, at least, you know, every, every time I go into, you know, a, a, a recording studio and do some audio stuff and I have, I have fun in the studio, it's like doing, doing, you know, sort of like audio drama and silly voices and stuff. I think this, this is fab. Yeah. This is great. I'm very lucky to be able to do this because, yeah, not, not everyone who I sort of like trained with or who I've known in the past still gets the chance to do it. So it's, you yeah, know, it's good. So, as you said, with your height, is that something, do you find that a boon or is it something that, um, is it helpful with your career, do you think? Oh, completely. I think I think it's, um, it means that I'm sort of um, very specifically sort of castable in a certain, yeah. in a certain, in a certain, uh, in a certain way. I mean, so like the first time, you know, because the thing which has been my calling card for, that, for, that, for quite the rest of my career was, was Doctor Who. Right. And I think I got seen for that because I was a very, very specific um, height. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the, the, the point is, it's. I think you're aware, you've got to be aware of the kind of like the, uh, of, of what it is. At least at, at, at drama school at Bristol, we're very so clear about what you're selling as a company. Yeah. You know, but you, you, can't, you know, don't be sort of com completely sort of uh, constrained by that because there are things which you, you know, there are avenues that you want to go down that like, aren't the obvious ones and you shouldn't feel you've got to work harder at those. But it's like equally, be aware of this, like what's, what you're presenting in a, you know, what you are as a, as a product, it's not in a horrible way, but sort of yeah. how your castability sort of works. And yeah, the fact that I've, I'm an unusual height yeah. is, uh, is, is, is useful and I get work from that. So it's something yeah. which, you know, you embrace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think it's, um, I had a chat to a friend of a friend who sort of like was only in his early twenties. And I think he was, 
you know, five foot seven and quite wiry. And he was sort of like, clearly sort of like dealing with the fact that he wasn't Russell Crowe. He's like, yeah, well, sorry, yeah. mate, no. Yeah. You, you know, that, 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 that's, that's part of a process that people kind of go through, you know. So perhaps if they've got one image of themselves in their head and then sort of like they come up to reality and stuff. Yeah, yeah. It's a very different sort of, uh, different sort of thing, you know. It's a whole thing. If I was sort of like five foot eleven, sort of like dark haired and blandly handsome, I think there's a lot more of those. Whereas yeah. the fact that I'm an unusual set of proportions, that's kind of that's 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 to my favour. As you mentioned, Doctor Who, where how what was the process from going from sort of is it graduating from the Bristol Old Vic to Doctor Who? How did, what was what happened between that time? Oh gosh, well I did quite a few other jobs. I, I was very lucky after after drama school that I sort of I continued to work fairly good. The, the main thing which I when I left, I just wanted to maintain uh, momentum. And, and luckily enough, I did with you know, so like a jobs came along, lots of lots of different things. I mean, you know, lots of stage stuff. Um, I think I had a there was a competition at sort of like um, in the your final year at drama school called the Carlton Hobbs competition, which is like introduced you to BBC Radio. So I think I'd done a radio play or two. Um, but then simply, uh, I was doing a play in um, in a forest, sort of like uh, out, out of, near Ipswich. So it wasn't really sort of, it was quite, quite quite remote. And a TV casting came up, casting director who knew me from drama school. And I wasn't able to go to that just because simply we were, you know, we, we sort of had to just like you know, be, be you know, really putting the set together from about 12. So that, that was a bit annoying. But, you know, these things come up, you know. It's, it's, it's like, so I was having a chat with my agent as a result from that. This was about sort of like a year after I... Year after I left drama school, um, and during that chat, I went, "Oh God, well, it's going to be my thirtieth uh, birthday next month," and I just, yeah, you know, just, just, just off the top of my head, "Oh, it's a birthday present. I love being Doctor Who because that was my favourite program when I was a kid." And uh, she went, "Oh, okay," and clocked that, and then it just happened to come inside, you know, unbeknownst to me, that they were bringing back the Santarans, who were a classic series villain, right? And I think they must have already cast Chris Ryan in that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, from the young ones. Yeah. He was even smaller than I am, and if yes. they'd made a suit to fit him, then obviously they've got they've got a very specific, and they I think that they made a decision that they wanted them to be quite small and compact. So all of a sudden, right, they probably sort of like you know because I didn't have any particular sort of t I didn't have any TV credits before then, but you know so I was up for a part that was actually sort of quite nice, quite quite a quite a big quite a meaty role relatively. Mm. I was in some prosthetics, but sort yeah. of, uh, and again the point that I'm five foot two, um was my favourite, that, that opened the door to me. Yeah. Also, having been a massive Doctor Who fan when I was a kid, meant that when I went to audition, I could speak fluent geek. Yeah. And um, and also, when I sort of got the job and I got on set, then sort of like, oh, because at the time they were doing Doctor Who Confidential, which was the kind of, uh, the behind the scenes programme, which they filmed parallel with the um, yeah, yeah. with the TV show. The fact that I knew what, was to, what I was talking about in terms of the continuity and all that sort of thing, went, oh, oh okay, that's, yeah. that's nice. And I think everyone who works in the programme, um, you know, was a fan when they were growing up as well. It's got yeah. that kind of continuity and stuff. So I think, oh, okay, that's that's good. So yeah, so it was first off. It was in two thousand and seven. I got cast, and the episode was out in two thousand and eight. Yeah, and that was a wonderful one off. I remember one of my one of my mates from drama school going, "Oh, so you can retire now, can't you?" So I guess yeah, <laughs> I don't know, yeah, it was good. But um, but yeah, so it was it was it, it was a fantastic first TV job. Obviously, it's the weird thing of. Uh, of being in full prosthetics is that no one knows what you look like. <laughs> but, um, but it's still, it's still, still, still a, good, a, a good credit to have. What was it like uh, acting with uh, all the sort of latex and stuff? It's very interesting as a process, because I think I would have been, obviously it was my first television job. Um, I had a little bit of, you know, sort of camera training. Um, uh, at drama school, but you know, so you know, literally, literally, so like a couple of weeks. Right. So I think, I think I would have been a lot more nervous had um, had I uh, had I not had that content to contend with, which is, uh, you know, because you go to you know, every every time I do a television now, it's like oh, I'm doing too, you know, because you go into it, it's like sort of from 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 cold a little bit. Oh, I'm being too big for my face with my face or whatever. You know, is this going to read properly? You know. Yeah. Whereas this, there's so much. You know, you're inside this kind of rubber thing. You know, you've got to get up three hours, three or four hours before everybody else. You know, this whole sort of lot of parameters to contend with meant that sort of uh, actually that 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 sort of dissipated all the kind of nerves that I would have had to like normally the kind of thing. I mean, the first read through, I suppose, when I went and sort of like uh, met Ariane, like Russell T Davis, and sort of like um. 
David Tennant and Catherine Tate, you know, were absolutely psyching their pomp. It was, it was, in some ways, it was the biggest programme on sort of TV at yeah, the time. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was good. It was a whole thing of like, okay, just trust that I can sort of do this. And so, you know, there's a couple of, I know there are some nice funny lines in the script that I can ping out. And um, and the read-through went, yeah, good. Okay, everyone's on the side of the read-through, so that, that's good. So I've made, made my mark there. Yeah. But then it's like, then, then, then just being in this rubber thing was quite, uh, was quite extraordinary. But equally, it's, it's nice because I think sometimes when you go on set for the first time, you're a guest. Then you're in your trailer, you put your costume on, and then it's like, knock on the door, go to set, <sighs> okay, take a deep breath, and it's like, there's no one. And then hopefully, you know, most, most of the time it's like regulars or leads or whatever that will make you feel, will make yeah. you feel welcome or whatever, you know, it's, it's not, you know, there's people whose job is to be nice to you on set as well, like runners and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Whereas I was kind of part of the prosthetics department. And it's only a little bit later I realised how useful that was. Mm -hmm. Because they were very good, very, very professional. But the whole point is you kind of have a sort of set of PAs going around with you to actually sort of make sure. And lots of their job is like, you know, so sort of gluing your face back. Right. Because, you know, prosthetics have got a very, very limited time span when they're so like they're they're ready for. So, you know, they so like, you know, glue it on and sort of paint it up, ready for lights up at eight. But then of course, you know, they'll first of all do wide shots. And they'll get closer and closer and closer. And, you know, if it's, you know, sort of 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock or so, by the time you're doing your close-up, then, you know, if it's a hot day like today, today it's very warm. Mm -hmm. If it's a warm day like today and you're inside that, you're perspiring. So simply the mask will start to slide off your face. Yeah. So they're going to have to, have, going to, have to re -glue it. Equally, if there's something doing the close-ups after lunch, then you've had something to eat. So then it's got to have touch-ups as well because inevitably some of the makeup will be sort of moved. So it's, it's a very odd sort of counter-instinctual process in terms of, how you would, you know, because obviously, usually the usual process of filming is that you'll do a wide shot, then it's useful because you can get used to things, then you should punch in and sort of do your type of thing. So you kind of know what you're doing and you've got used to blocking. Mm -hmm. Whereas with, with the prosthetic, it's got that limited lifespan that um, you want it to sort of, uh, you know, from the prosthetics department point of view, it would be nicer if they just shot it straight away in your close up and then, yeah, yeah. you know, it starts to hang off your face a bit more, then do the bite. But that's, that's, that's not, that's not how it kind of works. Yeah. So, um, but equally be, being with this group, this team of people who are also like, you know, all very nice. Part of that, part of their training is they actually get glued up in the, you know, because they're, they're not, they're not actors, but they'll, part of the training is to actually, so they get glued into a full on, prosthetic to fit, to find out what it's like for the performer inside. Right. So, so they can have that empathetic sort of thing of going, okay, Okay, yeah. I see what you know. That's I, I, probably I, good. Yeah, yeah, which 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 is very good and very important. And and you know, the Millennium Effects team with the uh, the Millennium Effects was the company when I was doing Doctor Who who were doing it, and they were all, yeah, you know, very very good, very professional, very very sympathetic, and also they they'd fight your corner in terms of, you know, obviously as you know, you know what it's like on a, on a TV film set. Right. Time is always constrained, yeah, yeah. and they're all like, no, we need five minutes just to retouch this or whatever. So yeah, you're kind of part of that team, as it were. You know, yeah. you're one of the actors, but also you're part of the sort of prosthetics team. So it's kind of, it's it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, thing. It and, seems and, like that is a that is a constant battle for on mm. set. Is like time is the most important mm. thing, but also getting what we want is the most important thing. Yeah, and, and, and each department will fight their corner in order to do that, whether it's sound, whether it's lighting or whatever. Right. And it's an interesting thing because as an actor inside prosthetics, you're obviously, I'm an actor, I want to make sure that my performance is ideal. But also, when I've got something as extreme as that on my face, it's almost, I'm kind of, kind of puppeting a mask as well. Right. So I realise that, and again, it's only when I've been doing this, when I was a, a regular in... Um, Wizards vs. Aliens, which is another children's BBC programme that Russell Davis and Phil Ford created. Um, I was a hobgoblin in that, so I had sort of like a, a big sort of, again, extreme prosthetic. Because I was in that sort of like over the course of, you know, a couple, you know uh, about three months or so. When you're doing it day in, day out, you get you just get an idea about the grammar of a film set a lot better. Whereas if you're just sort of like a, a guest in something like that, you go in there and it's kind of like lots of things happening and you're, you know, 200 people going, ah, yeah. and you're trying to deal with this thing, this, this yeah. big prosthesis on you. It's, it's much more difficult to, to get an idea about where you fit in. Whereas when it was a slower thing, where I could actually see how I fitted in and you know, what all the departments do. You know, it's interesting, yeah, it, 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 it's a big thing to actually get used to, but it is an industrial, it's an industrial space. It's a light industrial space, yeah. but it's an industrial space where you've got, you know, up to like, you know, 60 odd people all working towards a, um, sorry, it's a creaky chair there. That's yes, right. When you've got 60 odd people working towards a particular end, then yeah, there, there, there's a lot of fingers in the pie there. Um, and then what I'm doing is kind of trying to perform, um, give a performance, which is not just me, but it's also, it's also motivating this kind of mask. So it's not quite being a puppeteer, but it's also seeing how the mask responds and how it's lit, you know. So we're talking about Strax in Doctor Who. And if I tilted my head in a certain way, 
then his eyes disappear because he's got a very heavy yeah, brow yeah. so it's very difficult to light. Um, there was another, yeah, this other character, Randall Moon, who was a hobgoblin, had a big nose and big ears. I had to point my nose in a certain way towards the lens, otherwise one of his eyes would disappear because it's you know, because the nose is so big. So it's the kind of thing you get used to how you move it. Yeah, it's, it's not a million, and so. It's not a million miles away from what you do in theatre when you've actually got to learn choreography or you've got to sort of, uh, you know, sort of, it, 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 there's probably more stylized physicality towards things. But right. all these things feed into then what you're doing on screen to make it work technically. Do you ever deal with the level of stress with, so obviously, you're trying to give a performance, but at the same time, as you said, there's like 60 people around you all doing their thing with all their own stresses. So the, the level of stress is high, time is, is on you, as well as you're covered in this prosthetics. Do you ever have a point where you're like, not only are you trying to act and pretend that there's not all these people around you, but you're thinking, what is, what is on my face right now? Why mm. am I doing this? Occasionally, I mean, it's quite useful actually, because you're sort of cocooned. Right. So that means you don't have to engage with the outside world quite as much. Oh, okay. So as, you're, like, um, you're in your own bubble. Yes. Yeah, in your own bubble in some ways. But I remember um, the first episode where I did Strax, you know, because that was a really fun part. When I sort of read the script, oh, that, that's really good. And it went really down, went down really well at the read-through. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. And then the first day on set, and again, it's the first time I'd sort of like, you know, been in that, that prosthetic for a couple of years. And of course, you get up at five o'clock in the morning. We're filming, we're filming on location somewhere inhospitable. Mm -hmm. So I like on the outskirts of Cardiff in January, you know, so it's, yeah. it's really, really sort of like, you know, quite, quite heavy duty. And there's a whole thing of, right, okay, I haven't had that much sleep. I think I know the lines, but I had two very similar lines in two scenes that we were filming consecutively. And they had a whole lot of explosions. It was a war zone. They had lots of explosions, time to go off in the background. Um, and it's a whole thing of, so I'm just trying not to get tongue tied. And there's a whole thing of, okay, if I get this wrong, they're going to have to repack an entire cylinder, which is going to take half an hour yeah. to go do that. So I can't just fluff it. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the kind of thing where you're aware of it's like okay you're aware of your part in the in the sort of cult yeah, but then yeah. you've got to part of the job is as well actually just going just just have a talk to yourself calm yourself down and I think I think that, that that's another thing as well which which you get used to doing. Um, I did another series again when I was in prosthetics. Um, again it was Russell T and Phil mm -hmm. Ford uh, the Sarah Jane Adventures which right. was the precursor yeah, to yeah. Wizards vs Aliens which was a Doctor Who spin off of Children's BBC. Um, and I tried on the prosthetic for that. And that's, that's the most heavy duty thing I've, I've worn because I had a motor on my head, which was kind of, um, had a, a chassis in it. So I was like a cyclops okay. with an eye that's like moved around. Right. Um, and unlike the other masks, which are kind of like, like a mask, which is glued to your face so you can see through it. This was like being inside something. So it was like being okay. inside, you know, a diving helmet yeah. type thing. So the actual eye holes in the mask, you know, I'm looking through the nostrils of it and they're both the size of a five pence piece. Yeah. So I've only got tunnel vision and I'm kind of inside this thing and that's the only time I've actually had a bit of claustrophobia. Mm -hmm. So that's when I had a chance, you know, for the first 10 minutes, I just had a little chat to myself going, no, come on, you're fine. You're fine. Just breathe. It's okay. Yeah, okay. And then we're like, it's all right. But it, it, it's an interesting thing where you like, just, just have a little chat to yourself and you sort of, um, yeah. and you're right with things. But yeah, it, 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 it's, I think, I think the things that you learn how to do on the job. I think you're aware of how to do them and it's kind of, uh, yeah. It's, it's interesting, I was, I was having a, it's interesting that those kind of things where the, where the, the when the camera is on you and there is that amount of stress going out. Yeah, well, theatre is one thing, but you get a chance to rehearse for that. And right. so it's like taking a running jump at something and you trust that you've, you know, rehearsed for like a couple of days or weeks or whatever that you're going to produce something. Whereas sometimes I don't get that nervous in castings anymore. But sometimes when you've got a lot of sides to learn for a, sort of like a, for a on-camera audition, then sometimes it can be, I, I was up for a, a thing last year sometime and it was very, very fast talking. So I'd learned the script, I'd had learned it, this little speak, couple of you know, lines of speech or whatever, a couple of pages of speech, but I'd learned it to a certain rhythm. And the casting director was like, no, 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 they want it quicker than that. No, do it quicker, just throw the lines away. It's like, and it was a whole thing of going, right. And I kept on sort of, doing it where you sort of slightly sort of fluff the line or whatever, but it's kind of a thing of, I could feel, okay, just have a chat to yourself. No, it's fine. Just breathe. That's all right. And it's the whole thing of just, just checking in with yourself mentally to actually sort of go, yeah. no, okay, you've done it in this way. Let's throw that out the window. Do it like this now. And just, yeah, just, just keeping yourself calm, yeah. relaxing yourself. And that's, that's the kind of thing as well, which, which is useful to have on screen. Mm. Do you get nerves a lot on set? Is that something that ever on goes set? away? No, not, not so much on set. I don't know. 
I think sometimes it, 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 it's interesting. I was, because the last last thing I did was um, a little bit in years and years. You know, the, right. again, Russell T. Davis's most recent series, and I only had sort of three lines in that as a kind of a, as a little character. And in some ways, it's more tricky sort of doing those three lines than it is being a regular character in something. Even if you've got screeds of. You know, like Wizards vs. Aliens, it was this kind of like, this very, very sort of baroque, sort of like, um, I will be doing this. You know, the, mm. the, the dialogue was very sort of like, you know, stylized, written. But I, because I got used to that as a character, I knew how to learn it. Because I've got the sort of character within me and I've got his physicality and I've got how he speaks. Whereas this is something new, it's a different set, it's something different. Even though it's three lines, you sort of go, blah, blah, blah. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, so it's, it, it's an interesting one when you don't have the chance to relax into it in quite that way. I mean, everyone was lovely, but it's kind of, uh, and yeah, uh, that's the thing. But most of the time you're working with people and they've been, yeah, you know, they've been on set for a long time. Most of the time you beat people on set and, and they're actually quite nice. You know, yeah. I, I think I've, perhaps I've been very lucky, but so most of the time, you know, we're actors, we want to help each other. It's, it's, it's one of the, you know, it's one of the principles of impro mm. that I've always have used is that try and make the other person look good and then you'll both look better. Yeah. And I think that's you know that that that, that that's that's a useful way of working. Mm. Um, but yeah, sometimes coming in with just three lines and something is more difficult than coming in with something you know, having a character you know, but you know having to learn you know ten pages of dialogue for them. Yeah, you know. we're talking about years and years. That's mm. recently, like I, you've been popping up everywhere for me, and I get <laughs> messages constantly like, "Have you seen this? Dan's in this. Dan's stuck, isn't that?" Yeah, I'm like, "Yeah, I know." Mm. Like so, uh, me and my mm. girlfriend were watching horrible histories, yeah. and. We sort of just left CBBC on, and then you came up on class dismissed. Yes, and uh, you were yeah. you were playing an art teacher. Yeah, and there was one bit I loved where it was the end of the scene, and you just went back into the wall because at the beginning you come out yes. the wall with all yeah. like the art on you. Yeah, and then they just, I think they reversed it. Yeah, where you just yeah, went yeah, back yeah. in. I yeah. thought that was fantastic. Yeah, yeah, no, it's Mr. Mr. Rom, the art teacher, who's yeah. basically Andy Warhol. Yeah, this is a uh, children's BBC program, class dismissed, that I'm in, and playing sort of like. A, I don't know how many teachers I'm playing. We, we all, all the adults play multiple multiple roles, right, yeah. um, and so all the kids are normal, and all the teachers are mad. But yeah, yeah, yeah it, it, it's yeah, there's, there's, there's great fun stuff. It's one of those programs that's sort of like it's not talking down to kids. It's it's definitely it's definitely for children, but right. adults can watch it and appreciate it as well. Yeah. There's a whole thing of I've noticed a lot of that recently as yeah. well, especially on CBBC. Is there yeah. these programs that aren't patronising at all? Which Completely, is and I think it's also one of those things because uh, certainly when I was that age, I mean, I, we only got a video recorder when I was eleven, but I, right. I remember so like watching things over and over and over again, like I think watching the original Clash of the Titans, oh, recorded it one Easter, watching that over and over yeah, and over yeah. again. I think parents who can so like have that, <laughs> it's got that test, like if their kid is watching that over and over and over again, then they don't want to commit suicide after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, the 13th watch when you've got Mr. Rom on there. Is a, yeah. So I, th I think it's well, very well sort of constructed from that. So like adults can get, get stuff out of it as well as, you know, the kid, the children can. It, 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 yeah. it, 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 um, I don't know when I was a kid as well, because I think the BBC has always been very good at this. Watching so like something which was funny with my dad, mm -hmm. and if my dad laughed at it as well, it's like oh yeah, that's that's a, that's a, that's a, it's, it's it's a nice bonding thing that's sort of like yeah that. yeah yeah. That was uh, did you is that how you sort of discovered comedy and comedy you liked with watching things with your dad because oh god gotcha, I did yeah, it with, yeah. with my dad yeah he showed me like Bottom and then Monty Python and things yes. like that and everyone he was like you might not get it and I was like oh it's okay and every time yeah. I got it and you. But when you grow up, you then get it on different levels and things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Is that the same with you? I think definitely sort of like, you know, like, like uh, Mel Brooks films, like uh, mm. Blazing Saddles mm. and Young Frank Frankenstein. Yeah, again, I watched them very young. Yes. Yeah, no, completely, yeah. yeah. I, I remember sort of like being able to sing the entirety of um, Lily von Stupp's sort of like, you know, Marlene Dietrich song, Here I Stand, the God of Thought Desire. Yeah. I remember being able to sing all that at primary school. Remember, you know, not, not really understanding what some of the jokes were. Yeah. I was like, just, just, um, yeah, just, just don't sing that in the playground. Yeah. Quite the same way, but it was... Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I remember yeah. I would sing songs from South Park when I was young. Oh, gosh, and okay. My mum yeah. would be like, you can't say that. And I was like, I don't know why, though. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's yeah, the song. Yeah, yeah. And it always, you know, only clicks in afterwards, going, oh, well, yes. oh, okay, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. Yes. I was just going to ask, with before moving away from Doctor Who with Strax, <clears throat> is there any part of you that you relate with Strax? Do you ever fancy obliterating people? <laughs> yes, I'm sure I'm bad tempered like Strax, definitely. I mean, I, I think I think um, Strax is essentially polite and well meaning, but he's also a psychotic alien, yeah. so it's fine. I, yeah, I think def def definitely there's there's a strain of annoyance mm. about things, which kind of like I often get cast as a short angry man. I'm not constantly angry. Right, but sort of like it's 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 it, it, it's it's an image again. It's going back to what you were saying about sort of uh, what your casting bracket is as well. I think that's quite a nice comic archetype. You like to see the, the short annoyed man who's always like kicking off about things. Yeah. That's kind of like that, that. That's not what I'm like all the time. But I certainly have a kind of like a 
a low tolerance threshold for certain things that annoy me. Right. So I'm often sort of shouting at the sort of like the uh, the automatic checkout things in sort of like in Sainsbury's or Little or whatever. Or okay. So so yeah, that's that's the, 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 there are elements of that. Yeah. I, right. I don't I don't lose my rag with people very often. It's usually sort of technology and stuff. Okay. But, but certainly those things. Yeah, these these things feed into feed into stuff. Yeah, yeah. So, well, that actually yeah. brings me on. I made a list yeah. recently. <laughs> and I want to see what you think about all of them. Yeah. If you can help with your own as well, mm. that would be great. Mm. But the list is titled uh, "Things That Are Just Not Okay." Right. Right. So I'll go through it and see yeah. what you think. So number one is food on trains. So specifically, mm. there was a case where I was in Brighton not long ago, yeah, and two people came onto the train with a whole pizza, right, in a box right. that they just bought. Uh, instantly, you could smell it. Yeah, they sat down right next to someone and yes. opened up the pizza and started yeah. eating it on the train. Right, and I could see that lady's face sitting next to them. I was like, oh no, God. that's that's not on, is it? Yeah, no. that's just basically intrusive. Yeah. And I, yes. I remember, I was, this is how the list started, because I turned to my girlfriend, I was like, mm. that's just not okay, is mm. it? Like, surely you can be self-aware. Yes. I don't know. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, my snack of choice is a, is a vegetable samosa, which I haven't think, and I always, always try and sort of like snap all back, so like in a discreet way. Yeah, yeah. But it's sort of not everyone sort of is, uh, is, is down with that, but it's not, it's usually not warm. Yeah. It's a kind of thing. But yeah, hot food, which is, yeah. but a pizza is a substantial thing. It's at least so like a box is about sort of a foot square, isn't it? Exactly, so yeah. Of, yes. Um, yeah. Number two mm. is uh, kids on scooters in a supermarket. I don't know if you've experienced that. I haven't, but definitely that's not that's not a. So you've got trolleys, haven't you? So you can make a case that another thing on wheels. But no, that's yeah. That's how big the supermarket is as well. But it's it's, yes. it's not good in Lidl. No, that no, 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 no. Lidl's no, no, already no. a nightmare to get yes. through. Yeah. and then you've got yeah. these kids that are just suddenly zooming past. And yes, it's like, oh, can you? Yeah. Um, number three is playing music from a speaker outside. No, that's no. No, it, 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 I suppose it depends on the space, really. If it's a big park or something like that, right, that's yeah. fine. It depends how loud it is as well. If it's a small yeah. ambient thing, fair enough. But no, it's just like, thing, or, or on bloody public transport as well, you know, when you've yeah. got someone, you know, sort of broadcasting out there, usually crap music. Yeah, so I've got that, like brackets, it. shit music. Shit music, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, let's not, um, let's not beat around the bush. It's a whole thing of, yeah. Yeah, you know, I don't do this. I thought I was, but equally, it's something. If if you're bu- bu- your, if you're broadcasting your shit music mm-hmm. in a public way, then I also have the right to tell you that it's shit yes. because you're invading my personal space as exactly, well. Exactly. Right. Actually, the best one of those which I saw, which was actually years ago, is there was this fella on a um, on the top deck of a bus, and he was leaning over his iPhone. You know, he craned his neck. Right. And but it was and it was like quite loud, <laughs> but it was Pavarotti. Okay. <laughs> and it was like Nessun Dorma or something. Like, Nessun Dorma, Nessun Dorma. I thought actually that's 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 odd enough that sort of yeah. like I'm, I'm I'm kind of happy with that. And also he was clearly sort of, he was quite he was a, yeah, yeah. very very intently focused on it in a way that I thought yeah perhaps that's that's that's, that's very important for you mm. in a way that someone just sort of willy nilly kind of. Uh, I was I was at well, I used to work at Costa, and there was a guy that would come in, and. He came in and he sat down with a coffee. Mm. Uh, the, the place was pretty empty. Yeah. There were still some people there. Yeah. And we were just sort of going around work, like, yeah. working. But it's quite empty. He had like a few mm. cups in front of him and he just started, he picked up his spoons and started just ding, 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 and just started making music to himself. Yeah. Normally that would annoy me, but the situation was so weird. I was like, you know what? That's funny. I'm okay yeah. with that. Yeah. Um, uh, I Number four, which is my final one. Yes. Uh, it's when people say, I'm not being funny, but, and then say something. Yeah. They're never being funny. Nothing about, they don't need to tell me that it's going to be not yeah. funny. I, I will get that from the statement that they're making. Yeah. It's no, that's quite a South Walesian verbal tick though. It's like, I'm not being funny, but yeah. uh, it's, 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 it's a very, that's a, that's a, that's quite a common phrase like here in Cardiff a lot. Like, I'm not being funny. Um, yeah, in yeah. all fairness, I got to see. You know, all, but the all qualifiers. It okay. Yeah, absolutely. Because it's, 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 it's quite, it's quite, it's quite a thing. But yeah, I'm not fit. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, <laughs> all, 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 the, all the nuclear version is, I'm not being racist, but. It's yes, like, yeah. Ah, but I, uh, yeah, I yeah. think I think so. Yeah. Going. Yeah, yeah. Or the I'm not I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, I was like, are you going to lie to you? Yeah, no word of a lie. That's, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's a very yeah. fine. Um, yeah. yeah, that was my list of things that are not things okay. that are not okay. <laughs> yes. So comedy improv is something you do a lot. Yes. How did that sort of happen? Well, actually, that's one of the things. Um, Think about it. Is one of the things that sort of got me back into sort of like acting and making me think. Oh, okay. Do you know what drama school? That's a possibility. Um, when I was, 
as I say, I had this hiatus in between sort of university and, sort of, and, and formal training, but um, I was sort of, like, doing various bits and pieces. And one of uh, my mates, he went off to, um, eventually he went off to film school in New York, but we made a little short film together, um, uh, which was uh, an urban vampire film. Right. And also cleverly, he decided he wanted to shoot it on Super 8. Okay. And the thing about Super 8 is it works best in daylight. The thing yeah. about vampires is they don't go out in the day. So we, we, made, a, we made a bit of a, a rod for our own backs there. Good. Um, so it took about a year to make. Okay. <clears throat> I was having a chat. I had a book called Impro, which is quite sort of like, a, sort of like a, one of the standard tomes about improvisation, which I sort of got just as part of my general reading. And I was having a chat to the actress who I was doing this film with, this little short film, in a, in a glorious car park underneath Waterloo Station. Okay. And uh, I lent it to her as well. Oh, that's, that's, that's interesting. That's good. And then she gave it back to me a couple of weeks later and went, you know, there's a, there are people who teach a course based on this. Oh, are there? <laughs> and so, oh, okay, I didn't think you could do cause it. Because this is, this is before social media and that sort of thing. And so the internet was, yeah. you know, we Google a few things, but then, you know, yeah. there's so much going it's, on. There's no, there's no kind of centralised sort of thing. You forget yeah. how much it puts you in touch with things, you know, well, that's the thing. When I left university, I lost touch with a whole lot of people because I didn't have their contact details. I only got a mobile phone right. after I left university. There's lots of these things which are obvious now, but there was an obvious way of plugging into them in a, mm. in, a, in, a, in, a, in a in a kind of way. Um, you still discovered things through word of mouth. Yes, through word of mouth, absolutely. Yeah. And so I, I, um, that was it. It was my my my, my day job. They they worked, they worked out because they liked me. They worked out they'd got my holiday pay slightly wrong. So I suddenly got so like a little bit of a. A little bit of a nice wodge. Right. Just before, yeah, just, yes, it was just before my, 20, my 26th birthday. And so it was a little present to myself. I did this weekend course with a group called The Spontaneity Shop, who still teach up in Camden. Um, so one of the ladies who taught me impro, first of all, was Deborah Francis White, who's now does a bit of podcasting herself, right. if you've heard of her. Um, but um, so I did, I did, I ended up doing about a year's worth of evening classes in impro um, with The Spontaneity Shop. Um, Deborah and her husband Tom Solinsky sort of taught me and uh, and various other people as well and that absolutely got me back into sort of doing it regularly um, and it o- unlocked quite a lot of things so sort of, with me in, the, in terms of not overthinking stuff uh, in terms of sort of putting you in touch with what your instincts are you know the whole thing of you know if you say something and no one's laughed it's fine you haven't been shot that's okay at least yeah. you've said something the whole thing of the tyranny of the blank page it's, you know, it's, it's this whole thing of, oh, what do I write? Just sit down and write something. And at least you then you've got something to go on. You've got some grist for the right. middle, which you go with. It was a very, very useful thing. And in some ways, it was kind of like, I was sometimes thinking it was like the first year of my actual training. Because then off the back of that, I had one, I had one audition at a drama school. So before then, and I was just so nervous. I went, Bleh. It was just, it was just awful. Mm. Um, and I didn't like the atmosphere of the place. Um, and then a year's, you know, best part of, you know, the six months, sort of like impro classes and uh, and also I was doing bits of I was doing rehearsed readings there was a nice little sort of um, uh, art centre that I was doing that I, I had a relationship with in Barnes called the OSO um, very nice people around that there um, that I, yeah, so I had a bit more momentum going up for it but it was absolutely that thing of such as going I can go for an audition and do you know what if I get my speech wrong or whatever then it's fine I'll start again and I'll do it better and it's the whole thing of you know, one of the impro thing, one of the mantras they had it was like, just try and be average and you might be brilliant. If you go in there trying to think, oh, I've got to be the wittiest and the cleverest, you're going to hamstring yourself right. as well. Because it's, it's not a useful mindset to have. If you're aiming for perfection all the time, then you're going to constrain, you're just, it, it's more likely you're not going to do things rather than you're going to do things. Right. So there's, that, that's one of the first tenets that I, that I had. So, so it's, it, it, that's kind of like a baseline of, 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 of what I do. And I realised recently we had a, um, with one of the companies that I work with at the moment, which is like an improvising of Blighton show called Bumper Blighton, um, which is on social media. Um, um, we had a masterclass with uh, an improviser called Patty Styles, uh, who's very much from this school of improv, the spontaneity shop, does stuff with the Keith Johnson school. Um, and it was like, it was very interesting. It was having basic, oh, those are my instincts, having those instincts reaffirmed again, going, oh, exactly. That's the, I realised quite how much it's hardwired into me because I did that for a year, and then I went to drama school, I went to Bristol, which was great. It was quite formal in right. quite a lot of its training, and it sort of drills, I mean, very, very rigorous and thorough. And I remember in my second year when we started doing public performances, I felt like I could still play on stage in a way that some of my classmates, you know, you, you're very aware of what you're doing wrong. I think if, you know, because it's all about sort of, you know, drama schools, like stripping yourself away and sort of like putting things back together again. But I think the impro allowed me still to have that slight freedom to actually sort of try stuff out. 
Or at least that, that's the way, yeah. It kept, 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 me, kept me quite sane at various points in drama school because it, mm. it, it, it is very... It is very sort of... Um, it, it puts you under a lot of scrutiny as well. Right. So having, having that as a... Having that as a baseline is, is is very useful, and I I I I've, I've kind of dipped in and out of it um, over the years and stuff. It sounds um, like a useful tool because, especially with my experience with mm. uh, education and creative education, mm. creative arts, is there is a there seems to be this. This is how you do it. Yeah, which yeah. I find very bizarre, mm. and uh, I feel very strongly that that needs to change, especially in education. Mm. Um, if with people reading. And, and uh, studying your art and saying mm. no, you're doing that wrong. That seems very weird to me. Yeah, there's there's, there's things. I think it's a whole thing about how you approach it. It's like uh, with Bristol, it was it was very much like there's no ethos to it. But it was like we are giving you a toolkit. Mm. You have a tool now for this. You understand how to use your body as a mechanism. So there's so in some ways it's quite constraining. But equally, there's certain things to drill because that's just a technique of doing it. So I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong in teaching techniques. Right. Yeah. But and I think I think you can teach so like you know people about the fundamentals of drawing or whatever. So that you can teach people how to draw with perspective. You don't say you always have to use this. Right. But it's 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 another thing which will enable then you, for you to make a choice. That's the thing. But I think if as soon as you're not saying that is right and that is wrong, mm. then it's a different sort of uh, it's a different yeah. kind of fish. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Kind of, um, you know, my mum was an art teacher, you know, she's retired now, but it's a whole thing of going, you know, trying, looking at her, sort of wrestling with all these sort of different curriculum things that would come, it would change every year. And that's another set of, kind mm. of criteria as a kind of, as a kind of thing. But it's, it's it, you know, it's, 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 it's interesting, that sort of thing about how, yeah, I, I, I think there's a golden mean to yes. in between giving people technique and then sort of giving people sort of like the freedom to actually then apply that technique in whatever way they see fit. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think, yeah. Yeah, like 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 with it. it's 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 nice when you sort of like you, know, you do an impro show and there's a, an audience of thirty people in a small black box theatre. But if you try to do that size of performance on a stage in front of a thousand people, then it will get lost. Right. And the thing is, something like the kind of heavy duty stuff that I went through at drama school enables then for you to do that in front of a thousand seater and yeah, hope hopefully have that same level of freedom. So I think I think there's something to be said for both things. But yeah, it's a tricky one to actually sort of go out. And I think I think there are better ways of doing it than others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So do you prefer doing comedy than drama? Because especially recently, I'm obviously seeing you in years and years, and uh, I saw you pop up in Good Omens and stuff. Yeah. Is, um, do you like doing those like little drama bits, or do you prefer doing the comedy or like long form comedy stuff? I like. I, I mean, I do like doing both. I like having a mixture of things. Um, I think inevitably, after you've done one thing for a little while, then you it's a there's an itch that you want to scratch, hmm. and I suppose that's something I'm aware of at the moment is that I've done lots of multi-character stuff, which I'm good at and I like doing and it's fun, but equally I wouldn't mind playing a character where I can get my teeth into something, which I haven't done for a little bit. But I think it's I think they're different halves of the same thing, really. It's the whole thing of... Um, but one of my friends posted a quotation, it's Peter Ustinov, saying, comedy is just a funny way of saying something serious. Yeah. You've got to you've got to take it seriously. It's, it's going to be funnier if you take it seriously, if you're not asking for the gag all the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, something like Strax, you know, he's a great comic character, but you can't play the fact that you know it's a joke. See, he's yep. absolutely sincere. That's like, I look forward to meeting you on the field of battle and crushing the light from your worthless human form. Yeah. You know, he's actually very polite, but it comes out in a psychotic way. Yeah. You play the reality of that. And sometimes it's funnier if you do that. Mm. Equally, there's sometimes, it's, yeah, but it, 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 depends, it depends very much on the register of stuff that you're, you're doing it for. Class Dismissed is one example where its core audience is Shun's BBC, so that's six to 12 year olds. So it has kind of like it has a kind of um, an energy to it that's uh, that's commensurate with that. It's not all underplayed. It's you know sort of it is quite big, yeah. but equally you're sort of like you know you you, you find the uh, Mr. Potter, the deputy headmaster, who wants to be the headmaster. That's yes. a whole, there yeah. is a kind of like there's a real tragedy to that character as well, which is which is great fun to play. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, um, yeah. And so and so there is yeah you you, you oh, all the actors we've gone about truth all the time, but it, yeah. there is that thing you actually play the play the reality of it, and it's funnier mm. as well. Um, it's interesting quite a lot of the time now with. With sometimes when you go up for comedy things with the scripts, I think in the wake of The Office and sort of like the whole sort of pseudo documentary sort of thing, mm-hmm. it's clearly written in quite a broad style. I like, oh, just really underplay it, really underplay it. Yeah, just underplay it. So I mean, yeah, that's yeah, I can do that. That's not how it's written. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, and it's 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 interesting how there's all, often a sort of it's it's what different registers of comedy and different registers of writing are as well. Mm-hmm. Is that something? I mean, years and years ago, I went up for something which was. To my mind, it read like a single camera, uh, single camera sort of like a comedy drama right. type thing. That if this is all quite underplayed and it's got good high production values and that sort of thing, and shot like a kind of uh, shot like a sort of um, 
uh, like a thriller or something, but we're sort of like, you know, it's inherently ridiculous. Yeah. That's going to be good. And then I saw, I didn't, didn't get it, but it was a, and then I saw what they did with it on TV and they'd shot it like a sort of studio sitcom. Okay. I'm thinking, hang on, that, that's okay. That's, and it didn't do very well. Yeah. And yeah. I'm going, okay, that's, that's interesting thing. So, so there's lots of, there's lots of different tiers mm. as to who will have made decisions on that. To, uh, to make it a success or not. And, but, you know, that's, that's true of any creative process. There's lots of different gatekeepers. There's lots of different fingers in the pie and stuff. And, right. you know, and hopefully you're working with good collaborators that it, it all works, to a, it all works yeah. to a decent end. But, yeah, it's interesting when you see that mismatch. I've noticed a lot of, <clears throat> like you were talking about, a lot of comedies that come out the last 10 years following the Office format of. Mm. Uh, they don't even, where with The Office it was a, like a, a mock documentary. Yeah. It's now not even pretending to be a documentary yeah. it's just shot in a documentary style yes. yeah. and sometimes I watch those programs and I think is this just laziness hmm. because what you're doing is here comes the joke and you zoom in on the joke yes. and then a new character comes yeah. in you zoom out yeah. and yeah. it's like okay but yeah. if this didn't have this hmm. here would yeah. it be at all funny? Yeah. And I, yeah. I just wonder if that's become a corrupt for people. It's well, I think it's, 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 the, the things have a grammar to them as well. But you know, mm. I suppose the office is nearly twenty years old now, I suppose, which is which is interesting how much that's become part of the grammar of things. And so yeah, you know, yeah. But you know, something like um, I really enjoyed um, what we do in the shadows recently. I've seen that, which is, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. great fun. Which is some of it is very broad in some ways, but other bits, you know, it, it is absolutely that kind of. Um, yeah, you, you, it, 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 it embraces the reality of that kind of yeah. thing. So, yeah, I, that was like, when I saw that, yeah. I was like, oh, great, they're doing it. Someone's doing it in a new way again. Yes. It's like, yeah. oh, they understand what this can be used for. Yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah. And I suppose also now, which which wasn't the case, is that there's so much, uh, like, case in point, people creating their own content and stuff. And mm. so, you know, doing stuff which is a parody of YouTubers or that sort of thing, which is definitely not my generation, but so like it's kind right. of, um, you, can sort of, you can sort of see how that area is right for parody. Like I think Liam Williams' series, Please Like, did you see that on um, BBC Three? I don't think so. Which is very, no, it's, it's very, very, very smart, very, very funny, but it's about influencers and like kind of that kind of world. And, right. Yeah. yeah. So do you have a, is there like a goal for you? Is there a, a, like a dream project or anything like that? Or is it just, just do what I do and see where that goes? There's certainly, oh God, that's interesting. I don't think there's any one goal. I think sort of carrying on, actually, you know, at at the moment I'm probably in a, in a process of reassessment and stuff, but it's kind of, uh, but definitely there's things I'd like to do. Right. Yeah, but I think you've got to be fleet of foot with it as well, and realistic about how things that you do, because you know ultimately lots of things as an actor you don't have that much control. And I was having a chat to one of my mates the other day about it. You can say no to things, and actually that's that can be quite powerful. Which is go no, I won't right. go to that. But equally, when absolutely nothing is coming up, then yeah. So yeah. I think it's it's creating creating more of your own material. That's that's uh, that's the kind of thing. That's one one thing which I need to be getting uh, right. get get better getting better at. Anything specific like writing or Yeah, writing. I've started doing bits of writing for um I work a lot with Big Finish Audio who do the audio Doctor Who stuff. Okay. And so I've started writing for them a bit, which is nice because it's yeah. kind of like it's, you know, actually having to work in the structure of having a script editor and it's great because you know it's gonna get made and it'll actually get cast and with good good actors doing it. So yeah. you and you're working to a deadline crucially. Yeah. Because when you're working by yourself, actually having you know, have, making your own projects and having your own deadlines. You know, I might be able to write things, but I'm not the greatest producer right. so, like, in my head. So actually having an external thing is, is, is a good thing. But I think any, any actor I know who has lasted, uh, who has lasted, you know, so like any, any length in the industry has kind of um, initiated their own project. And I think that's probably what I need to, and that's what I need to get better at doing. So like creating, okay. creating my own, my own material and stuff. Right. Um, and I think also, as I say, just, you know, I wouldn't mind, I wouldn't mind a few more. Yeah, definitely, I, I love doing comedy, but it would be nice to do some gr- dramatic roles as well. Right? Yeah. So I get asked to quite what sort of uh, don't see my Hamlet. Yeah. You know, in ten years' time, it's precisely I'll be up to all for Hamlet by then. But it's kind of um, <laughs> so it's something yeah. you, like you said earlier, something you can really seek, sink your teeth into. Yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. But I, th- I, th- I think that's true of any actor. You want actually, right, right. you want to have something that allows you to stretch your muscles in in ways they haven't stretched for a little while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there you have it, Dan Starkey. I first met Dan when he worked on my graduation film, Bygone Broncos, which you guys might have heard me 
mentioned before. We also had David McGilvery on that. That should be coming out soonish. There's been lots of problems and sort of post. So yeah, I'll keep you updated with that. But hopefully you guys can see that at some point in the near future. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Thanks again to for everyone's feedback. Um, every like and share and everything like that really helps and helps the podcast grow as well. I will link Dan Starkey things down below as well as my social media and all that so you guys can keep following the podcast as it goes along. So more episodes to come. But for now, thanks to Toby Morgan for his graphics, Luke Perrett and Danny Young for their music. Thank you everyone for listening and I'll see you next time. Thank you.